as we receive the ministration of our daddy, Apostle Jonathan Langan, can we appreciate God with a shout and with a clap as he comes on stage? Somebody give Jesus a big clap of hand and a shout of praise. I think you can do better. I think you can do even better. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to say this before we get into the business of the day. First of all, it's so good to be in your midst again. I count it a privilege to be used by God as the speaker for this meeting. And I want to thank the president and the leadership of this house for choosing me. Can we celebrate God for our leaders? Thank you. Amen. And um, just give me a moment or two and then we'll sit down. Please help me so it doesn't echo too much. Um, I want to say that this ESM I'm seeing is a better ESM than the one I experienced when I was on campus. Yes. Amen. Just keep on, just be down, please, a bit. Um, ESM is really changing. Uh, I can see that there's a fire in this place. And um, God has blessed us with anointed leaders. Amen. And so I'm so happy with what God is doing in our midst. And my prayer is that it will keep growing from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. In Jesus' name. One more time, please celebrate yourself for being in this meeting. Amen. Amen. Now, just to say something before we sit down, um, I believe every session of the meeting today has been a blessing. I myself, from the little I participated in, um, I've been so blessed. The choir ministration, thank you very much, choir. You guys are wonderful. And um, the drama team. And I just want to say something on that. Uh, we are talking about discipleship this weekend, discipling the nations. And I thought it best to say this, that um, evangelism is the first step to discipling an individual. Jesus told them, go and make disciples of all nations. The word go means evangelism. That the gospel must get to every and any person that is around us. So, it is important that every one of us do the work of an evangelist. Make sure you, that you don't go through this school and finish without bringing a soul to Jesus. Is that as a, an assignment I'm giving to you? Make sure you don't finish from part one to part four or part five or part six without bringing at least one soul. For some of you, I want to challenge you one soul per session for God. For some of you, I even want to take it a bit further. One soul per semester. For some of you who are strong and have faith like me, one soul per month. Pick out one person you will witness to in 30 days. Get them saved and bring them to church. Amen? People need to know about Jesus. There are a lot of people who come around church who don't know Jesus. Honestly. And for some of you who are so bold, one soul per week. If you are in that category, let me see your hands. Ah, may God baptize people here today in Jesus' name. <laughs> one soul. I mean, seven days in a week is much. Just pick out one person, pray for that person Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. On Thursday, witness to the person. Friday, go again. Saturday, send a text message. By Sunday, they are saved. Bring them to church. If they are not saved, bring them like that. They will be saved in church. Amen? 
one of the ways to get the heart of God your way is being a soul winner. I'm telling you, um, there is so much. I don't have time to teach about that, but there is so much blessing attached to soul winning. Any fellowship that will grow must be involved in prayers and evangelism. No two ways about it. If you see a fellowship that is not growing, they are missing on one or both of these. Amen? During our days when we were on campus, ESM was the first fellowship that was having overflow. This, this fellowship. I remember that time people used to sit outside. There were canopies outside there and this side here. They used to have overflow. We were even teasing some of my friends then who were leaders. We were teasing them to have two services. Then services were in the morning. So we were telling some of them, why don't you get start two services? And I believe that revival will happen by the reason of this weekend. That souls will be won for our Lord Jesus. And this house will be so populated that you will lack space for people. In the Jesus name. Now please hold the hands of somebody. We are going to pray in agreement before we sit down just for one minute. Just make sure you are holding one person, not more than one. Let's just agree. Jesus said, whatever two of you shall agree at touching, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. I want you to agree with that person for a divine touch and a divine visitation for their life by reason of these three days in the name of Jesus. Please open your mouth and pray. Please lift your voice and pray. Agree with them. Let there be a definite visitation. Let there be a touch. Let the heavens be open over the life of my brother, my sister. Let grace be released. Let everything that stands as a limitation, a yoke, in her life, in his life, be broken. Let there be a mighty release, a touch from heaven. Make sure you are praying. Make sure you are praying. He says he has not called the seal of Jacob to seek him in vain. He has not called the seed of Jacob to seek him in vain. Oh, Rahana Begaladiva. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Thank you, Father. We cry for a visitation. Open the heavens. And let your glory be revealed. Let every life come under the influence of your spirit. In Jesus' name. Father, tonight I pray that by the ministry of your word, you will work wonders, miracles, signs. I pray that everything that stands as a limitation, as a yoke, as a burden over the life of anyone under the sound of my voice, let it be broken and let it be lifted. I pray for a tangible visitation of your presence in Jesus' precious name. God bless you. Please take your seat. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. You can play. You can play, but just be on the background for me, please. Amen. Yesterday we spoke about the making of a disciple. All right? And um, we said so much about it. It is important that we understand who a disciple is. Just bring it a little bit down, please. Just a little bit. Because the theme for this revival is to make disciples of all nations. And it is important that we understand the concept of being a disciple well enough for us to be able to disciple others. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses he said the same commit unto faithful men who will entrust it to others so you have to be a disciple of jesus you have to learn the ways of the master you have to follow him well enough for you to become a tool in his hands for the discipling of cities of territories and of nations and that's what we want to look at this weekend. And I gave us some of the basic characteristics of a true disciple that I cannot run down because of time today. I have very little time today and I want to make progress with every ounce of it. But today I want to talk about a very interesting topic. I want you to give me your ears, give me your attention, and then we are going to pray. Tonight... God is going to break certain yokes from our lives. Tonight is going to be a night of warfare and deliverance. I hope we pray in this fellowship. Good. The warfare of a disciple. Yesterday we looked at the making of a disciple. Today we want to look at the warfare. And I know that the subject of spiritual warfare is not new to believers, but it's also not been largely taught about. And my job as a privileged servant of God, as a true apostle of Jesus Christ, is to bring 
balance, to bring perspective, and to bring doctrine from the scripture. The Bible says to the end that your faith will be established. That's what happens when you sit under a true ministry. Faith is born. Knowledge is revealed. And there is an impartation of that knowledge that brings about faith. So that men can become mighty men for God in the kingdom. Luke chapter 10. I want to read verse 17 to verse 19. Please. Just before we continue, is there anybody here called Hanatu? Hanatu. Is there a name like that here? Hanatu. A lady. If there is such, please let me know. I'd like to pray with her before I'm done tonight. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Let's read verse 19. If you are a believer, if you are born again, and you have your Bible in front of you, at the count of three, let's read verse 19 together. One, two, three. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Jesus sent his disciples on an errand. He sent them to preach the gospel. If you read from verse 1 of this chapter that we just read, I hope it's okay if I teach a little. Please. You know, I'm more of a teacher. Amen? So don't get too bored as we talk. Many times the real impartations happen when the word of God is coming forth. The Bible says, And the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet when he spoke the word. So what you are hearing is not just information. Life and spirit is being imparted to you. And tonight, something will break open from heaven over us in Jesus' name. So, Jesus sent 70 of his disciples to cities that he would go to preach. Remember that all Jesus was doing was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so, he sent these 70. And he mandated them to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. But when they came back, they came back with a report that was quite different from their assignment. Their assignment was to go and preach the gospel and to heal the sick. And to tell the people they met on the way in the cities that the kingdom of God has come. What is the kingdom of God? I said it yesterday and I will go back to it again for today. The kingdom of God is the very life the system, the civilization, and the culture of God finding expression within any space. Or simply put, the kingdom of God is any space, any realm or atmosphere where the spirit of God has dominion and finds expression. Because the spirit of God is the life of God. The spirit of God is the one that powers the culture and the civilization of heaven. The Bible says in Job chapter 26 verse 13 that by his spirit he adorned the heavens. The spirit of God is the original material for all that God created. Anywhere the spirit of God finds expression, the kingdom of God is in that place. It is the spirit of God that brings the kingdom of God to bear. So if you have the spirit of God in you, you are a mobile carrier of the kingdom of God. It means that the rule of God, the dominion of God, the power of God can find expression in and around that place where you are because you carry the spirit of God, which is the very essence of God. If you are with me, say amen. amen. So that was Jesus' message. 
And so Jesus sent his disciples to go and preach. But when they came back, they came back with a different report. They said, Lord, even the demons were subject to us in your name. Now, if English language means anything at all to you, the word even means that this was not part of the equation. Isn't it? For instance, if I say, all girls like rice. Yes or no? Okay, there are some that don't like rice. They like semo. Two chinkafa. Amen. I hope that's not what somebody prepared in the hostel. You are waiting for me to finish preaching so that you can go and fall on it. Hey, just give me this moment. When we are done, you can go back and fall on it. Amen. For instance, if I say all girls like rice, even the women, I hope you understand what that means. That means that the noun that that adjective was used to qualify was not part of the original class. So they came back to Jesus and said, even the demons, that means everybody heard what we said. The sickness bowed to your name in which we preached. And even the demons, in other words, they, ex they didn't expect that demons would be submissive to the name of Jesus that was on their lips. And they said, even the demons were subject to us in your name. And Jesus told them in verse 18, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. That doesn't look like an answer to what they said. That doesn't look like an explanation. I was expecting that Jesus will explain why the demons were subject. But Jesus told them, I saw Satan. In other words, Jesus was saying, listen, don't think that it was because of what you were saying that gave you success in the field when you went to preach. You would have been met with resistance. The demons would have opposed you. They would have resisted your gospel. You would have come back even without one person healed. But something happened while you were on your way there. He said, I saw Satan fell like lightning. That means while you were on your way to carry out the assignment I sent you, I was contending with the one that will oppose you. Now, if the Bible says, I saw, the word saw means it was visual. It means it was revelational. That means there was a revelation that Jesus had about satan falling and if you are a christian at all you know that revelation is born in the place of prayer it takes prayer to be open to the revelations of the spirit that's the reason why it is good to drill yourself as a child of god in prayers it is prayer that activates your spiritual senses every potential of god that is in you will only find expression i know we have scientists here we have science students here and we understand in basic science the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is the energy that a body has at a state of rest. This table has the energy to move, but it's not moving. That energy is called potential. It's in it to move, but it cannot move except an external force acts on it, and then it can move. So the potential it has has been converted to a motion. That's what prayer does. When prayer comes upon you, it stirs up the potentials that you have. Many of you are prophets. Many of you are mighty men and women of God. Many of you have anointings to heal. But those things will only find expression when there is a drill that brings them to the surface. And that's what happens in the place of prayer. Jesus told them that before you went to preach, I had contended with Satan in the place of prayer. And in my contention, I had victory. And I saw that victory in that Satan fell like lightning from heaven. And so because Satan, who is the chief of the demons, fell, that's the reason why even the demons were subject to you in my name. Why was it in my name? Why not another person's name? Because I was the one who brought the victory. Somebody say warfare. 
Luke chapter 20, 11 rather. Luke 11, verse 20 to 22. Let's take a journey into the scriptures. Luke chapter 11, verse 20 to 22. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, of course the finger of God there meant the spirit of God. You will see it when you read Matthew's account of the same story. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see why I said the kingdom of God means the operation of the spirit of God. Now let's go on. 21. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than him comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. So Jesus is giving a scenario here. They were criticizing him for casting out devils. And their, 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 their argument was that the reason why he had power over devils was because he had the chief of devils in him, which is Satan. You know, the Bible used the word Beelzebub for Satan. This is not part of my message, but just for those of us who are interested in Bible knowledge, I can explain to you that the word Beelzebub is the Aramaic word, or the Greek word rather, for Satan. Originally, Beelzebub is two words in one. Bel and Zebub. Bel means Lord. You remember the God called Baal that Ahab served in the Bible. So Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. Fly. I mean fly. You know fly. If you are with me, say amen. I hope I'm not wasting your time. Okay. It means Lord of the Flies. Why did they use flies? The reason is because categorically the fly is one animal that has a lot of significance and characteristics that relates it with demons. For instance, flies disturb. Isn't it? And that's what demons do. They disturb. Flies go around dirty places. Demons are called unclean spirits. Can I go on? Let me stop there. That's good enough knowledge. So they accused Jesus of casting out demons because he had a priest called Beelzebub. But Jesus said, no, if I'm able to cast out demons, it's because the spirit of God is in me. And then Jesus told them that, see, when a strong man is guarding his house where there are goods, the goods are safe. But if a stronger than him comes and overpowers him, he exploits the goods in that house. Just like when you go to banks, you see that there is security around the bank because there, is tre there are treasures there. There is money there. And so, for you to break in and take those things, you will need to come with a force that is stronger than the security that the bank has. Now, Jesus gave us a mandate to disciple the nations. Remember that the nations or this whole world is still under the rulership and the system of darkness. Second Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 3 to 4. It says, but if our gospel is veiled, is hidden, it is hidden to those of whom the God of this world has blinded their eyes. The reason why we preach the gospel and there are some people that don't want to listen to us is not because what we are saying is not true. It's not because what we are saying is not concrete. It's not because they don't want to hear it. But it's because there are unseen forces that are sabotaging the work of the gospel. And what they do is that they build strongholds around people. There is a reason why you enter a Christian community and you still find drunkards there. There is a reason why you go to a church and you still find members of that church that are womanizers. 
There is a reason why people can come to church and sit under heavy sermons from January to December and their lives are not changing and they are not born again. There is a force that is behind the scene that the Bible says this force veils them. The word veil means to cover, to cover, to cover. The Bible says that the temple had three dimensions. There was the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place, the holy of holies. That there was a curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And it was called a veil. But when Jesus died, that curtain was torn from up to bottom. So that men can have access to God. But even though that veil has been torn, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us in verse 15 that to this day, though that veil is no longer existing in that temple, but that veil figuratively is still in the heart of people. There is something stopping the heart of men from receiving the gospel. There is something stopping the heart of men from embracing the life of God. There is a force stopping the heart of men from embracing the character, the nature of God. And the Bible says this force uses what we call veils. Somebody say veils. Say it again, veils. But Jesus said until a stronger man comes and overpowers him. If we must do the work of discipling the nations, we must understand that it is beyond a classroom curriculum. Discipleship is more than just, I know we have what we call ETS, isn't it? I know it because one of my bosom friends, we used to pray together those days on campus. He was one of their teachers here. He graduated from here. He was one of their ETS teachers. How many months does it take to do ETS? Huh, sir? Just a semester, right? Maybe three months or so. That's like the discipleship program, isn't it? Now, discipling the nations is beyond that one who, that for three months you come every week they give you handouts they teach you and that's the end you can do that one and the person is not born again I said it yesterday that one does not take away the power of witchcraft from the lives of people discipling the nations goes beyond that discipleship the call to discipleship is a call to serious contention. It's a battle for supremacy. That there are two kingdoms in this world that are at war against each other. And we have been caught in between this war. The kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of light. And the kingdom of darkness, which is the kingdom of Satan. And so if we must be able to disciple our territories... If we must see souls saved and men transformed to reflect the nature of Christ, we must understand that it is a call to warfare. Somebody say warfare. We must have to contend with the forces that lay claim on these people. The Bible says a strong man guards his house. That house there is talking about is not a literal house. That house there is talking about is a human being. Remember when Jesus was teaching about demon possession. In Matthew chapter 12, he said, When an unclean spirit is casted out, it goes through dry places, seeking rest, and it doesn't find the rest. Then the unclean spirit will say to himself, He said, I will return back to my house. Who is he calling his house? A human being. And you know, that demon is, he has nerves. He said, My house. Who gave you that house? God is the creator of everything. But because Satan has rule on earth, Satan has worked his way into possessing and having dominion over individuals, over cities, over territories. In fact, I don't mean to scare you, but in fact, there are churches, I will not mention names, but I say this with, with a lot of weeping in my heart, that there can even be churches that are under the influence of darkness. Read the book of Revelation. There was a church that John was talking, talking to and Jesus was rebuking. I think it was the church of Thyatira or so. He said, for you have accepted the teachings of Jezebel. 
I hope you are still playing, sir. So we, we must understand that this task is more than the natural. That before we will succeed in bringing men to the feet of Jesus, in bringing men to embrace the life and the culture of heaven, that we must go to war against the forces that seem to hold these men bound. There is a reason why that your uncle, he has been hearing of Jesus since you were small. Till date, he's not born again. Some of you have relatives that know the Bible more than you and they are not saved. Are you not surprised? Oh, you are not surprised? I know a drunkard who can quote scriptures years ago. I've seen them. There was a lady those many years ago, a um, um, few years ago while we were still on campus. I used to know her very well. She's a Muslim. This lady knew the Bible so much that she, I was the, at a point I was the only one she would talk to. You can't go and preach to her about Jesus. She will quote the scriptures for you, then bring the Quran version of it. So before I go to talk to her, I have to rehearse very well. You know rehearsals. I have to rehearse very well. But just knowing that doesn't mean she was saved. How is it possible that a man can know the word of God and yet not be saved, yet not be convicted? How is it possible that people can come to church year in, year out, and yet they don't embrace the life of God? There is a force that we are fighting in. Friends, you must understand that we have been, we are standing in a warfare and a battle situation. And until we know how to deal with the enemy, we may not make sizable progress in carrying out this task for God. And that may delay the coming of Jesus Christ. But God is going to give us grace this weekend to bring down the powers and the gates of hell in the name of Jesus. So the word of God is not silent about battles and contentions that we face as believers. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against what? Powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness. Now he ranks this, he brings dichotomy and ranking into the kingdom of darkness and how they operate that there are principalities i know many of us are used to witchcraft and don't make a mistake witches are different from principalities amen demons are different from principalities when it comes to demons the bible commands us to cast them out these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall do what cast out devils but here in Ephesians 6 verse 12, he said, For we wrestle not. You cast out demons, but you wrestle principalities. You can't just command a principality, go, and it goes. I will explain these things, don't worry. He says, we wrestle against principalities, against powers. Who is a principality? A principality, the word principality means a prince within a territory. That the demons or the spirits have a higher officer that they submit to. That is the one in, in, in charge of the command of the demons within that territory. And the assignment of demons is captured in the mission statement of Satan. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. When demons invade a life or invade a family or invade a community, they have no other business than to steal the identity of that family than to deprive them of their calling and their blessing to kill and destroy and see to it that the purpose of God in that family is never fulfilled. Somebody say, God forbid. Now these demons within a territory have a higher officer they submit to. It's called a prince. Powers are now higher spirits that come to strengthen and reinforce the principality. Powers are the ones that come to enslave men. And they enslave men in many ways I will share with you. The Bible says we are wrestling against this degree of demonic forces. These are the people that we are coming against. You now see why one soul, for one soul to be saved means a lot to God. 
Because it's not just your preaching to that one soul. There is a battle over that soul. And you are here tonight because God wants to conscript you in his army. To join in that battle and to command victories in these days. Somebody with me say amen. amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. From verse 3 to verse 5. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That though we walk as human beings. But when it comes to warfare, we don't war naturally. He said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Verse 4. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he begins to talk about how these strongholds exist. He said, casting down imaginations. These strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortified city or a fortified territory. If you pass a barracks... You see that they build certain things around that serve as, as, as defense, a defense mechanism, so that you cannot invade that place. You see barbed wire fences, or you see sandbags, or you see containers round about, that, so that that place can become a safe haven, and it becomes impregnable to the enemy. That's a stronghold. Now, just the way you have that in the natural, there are strongholds over the minds of people. Satan has built that in the minds of people. That's the reason why to some people, no matter how much you preach to them, they will repent on Sunday, be born again on Monday. By Friday, they go back to drink. Somebody says stronghold. That's what we are dealing with, my brothers and sisters. And this stronghold exists as imaginations. All Satan will do is make a man think in a way. Once he can get you to think along a line, you become a snare, you become a captive of your thoughts. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. If you want to control a man, you don't control him, you don't control him by pushing him about or using cane. No, you may use cane on him, but it doesn't mean you have his thoughts. All you need to do is create what we call mind control systems. Once you can get things that attract his thoughts and his mindset, he becomes a slave. And we are living in a world filled with all kinds of mind control systems. So the, battle is, the, the Bible is not silent about the warfare that every one of us as disciples will have to engage to see that this task is fulfilled. In carrying out our mandate, we are at war against the following. Listen to this and then we'll pray. We are at war against the following as long as we must carry out kingdom mandate. Number one, we are at war against the kingdom of darkness. We are at war against the kingdom of darkness. Top on the list is Satan and his agents. I mentioned it to you there from Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Satan is the top of the chain. And he has his demons. He has his principalities. He has his powers. He has rulers of the darkness of this world. You know darkness is the system controlling this world. Darkness does not just mean absence of light. Darkness is a system. And there are those who control it. There are spiritual wickedness in high places. These are policy makers in the spirit realm. They formulate policies and make the humans there enslaved to it. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, Of the prince of the power of the air, which is the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience, that means that the reason why they are disobedient is not because they want to be disobedient. But there is a prince, a power in the atmosphere that controls them. If you enter a village and you discover that there is teenage pregnancy, rampart, there is a prince, there is a force of wickedness controlling that. That once ladies get to 14, 15, 16, out of three, two must be pregnant. Some of you come from families like that, where they hardly get married legally. Without meaning any insult. Some of us may, respectfully speaking, even come from families where your parents didn't even get married legally. They escaped, and then all of you came forth. 
And now you can begin to see the pattern already trailing your siblings one after the other. I may not be here to preach to everybody, but as I mention your case, then you know that God came this night so that you can be delivered and so that you can receive empowerment from God to deliver souls from the snares of darkness and bring them to the feet of Jesus. Say a better amen. amen. Satan and his demons at the top. Territorial forces. The Bible tells us in the book of Mark chapter 4, when you read verse 35, through to chapter 5, Jesus just finished the crusade and he told his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Why? So that we can go and preach again. Just because Jesus said, let's cross over, if he looked for trouble. The Bible says, as they got on the boat and started crossing over, suddenly there was a storm and wind began to blow. The wind did not blow when he was, when he was not there. It was when Jesus said, let us cross over. Most times, I'm, I don't know if I'm talking to people here, where every time you decide to do something good for God, it seems as though there are oppositions that begin to rise against you. Every time you want to do something good, you want you prepared to come to church on Sunday. You iron your clothes on Saturday. You woke up on Sunday morning with, with stomach pain, stomach cramp. Eh? Every time you want to do something for God, God tells you for the next three days, wake up in the night and pray every 12 midnight for your family. And that's when all the sleep that you have not slept in the past, they pay you the arrears. Tell your neighbor it's not ordinary. If your neighbor doesn't, he doesn't believe, tell the other neighbor, brother, it is not ordinary. Or sister, it's not ordinary. They are doing contribution in church for project and you decide I'm going to give 5,000. You even mentioned that you will give 5,000. And that's when for one month your account remains dry. And out of shame, you can't even come to church again. There are forces we are dealing with. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. All of a sudden, a storm rose up. And guess what? By the time they went over to the other side, it became clear why they had an opposition in the sea. The Bible said when they crossed over to the other side, that place was called gatherings. There was a man there that met the first man Jesus met was a demon-possessed man. That means that the demons controlling that region saw Jesus coming to preach the gospel and the gospel is light that will outshine darkness. And they said, it's better we stop him from coming here. Some of you don't know the reason why you have so many battles around your life. It looks as though Satan left every other person and they face you. You know why? Maybe you, are, you have a mighty anointing on you that will bring deliverance to many. Some of you don't know why Satan attacks your finances. There is probably a grace on your life that God will use to bring many people out of poverty. Some of you are here. From childhood, you are always falling sick, falling sick, falling sick, falling sick. What is it? Satan may have seen a destiny that will bring deliverance and win souls for the kingdom. And Satan will say, that I will allow her to fulfill it. Let me kill her with sickness. But today, that yoke will be broken. Amen. I said that yoke will be broken. Amen. There are territorial forces. Forces are signed over territories, over regions. In dealing with the kingdom of darkness, we have also witchcraft, sorcery, divination. These things are not new to many of us. But just in case you felt, well, I'm not disturbing anybody, so I have no business with, with, with witchcraft. I want you to be enlightened about it today. The Bible spoke in the book of Acts chapter 8 that there was a witch doctor that was called Simon. The Bible says he bewitched the entire city of Samaria until Philip came with the gospel. It was Philip's gospel that brought light to that place. It is possible for witchcraft to be so strong in a territory that they bewitched the entire place. I'll tell you a story. I remember many years ago, my father is a pastor. I come from a line of preachers. My grandfather died a pastor. 
I was one of the first missionaries of cocaine, first indigenous missionaries of cocaine in Plateau South. They worked with the white men that brought the gospel. My dad is a pastor, a reverend, a preacher till today. And here I am. And many years ago, when we were in Lagos in a village, a, a small town in Lagos, we went to plant a church there. Uh, you know, all my life I've been into mission work, planting churches here and there. So we've had to deal with all these things. So my dad and his two pastors, they went to pray one night because the church was not growing. And so they went to pray to find out what the problem was and they went on three days dry fasting. In the church, not a well-built church, oh, zinc, like this, zinc everywhere. You know that kind of place, when the sun rises, all the water in your body will come out. You will be experiencing baptism. Eh? Your sweat will baptize you. By the evening of the first night, one of the pastors came to my father. True stories. I told my father, I said, you know, I'm an old man. I can't go beyond one day. Oh, I will just die. Oh. Allow me to eat something. My father said, okay, get something to eat. So they gave him Pepsi and he drank Pepsi. And in the night while they were sleeping, according to the story of the old man, he said, all of a sudden, three people appeared in front of him. Two women, one man. And they were tying white dress from their waist down. But from their waist up, they were naked. Women and men. White down, naked up. And they appeared and stood before him. And they said, so you are the one that's come to disturb us, eh? You, you. And they pounced on him. And he woke up from that vision and started shouting, hey, hey. Then he ran to my father. My father said, what's the problem? He said, they are here. Oh. They are here. Sure, you are the one who said you, you can't fast for long. You <laughs> Those were the powers controlling, the witches controlling that region. I've seen communities where they worship all kinds of things. Where they have deities, we've seen all. I've seen all kinds of control, demonic control, over cities and territories. So we are at war against the kingdom of darkness. Number two, we are at war against the corruption and the wickedness of this world. The Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. First John five nineteen. We are at war against the corruption and the wickedness of this world. It's already trending in social media now that ritualists. Teenagers are now into ritual killings everywhere. And I wonder why it's only ladies that they look for. That means ladies are no longer safe. Every lady in this house is safe in Jesus' name. Amen. Wickedness everywhere. Corruption everywhere. These are the things we are dealing with. All around us. And you know the power of sin and wickedness, it prevents God from shining the light of the gospel in a place. Isaiah 59 from verse 1 and 2, it says, The hand of the Lord is not short that he cannot save you. Neither is his ear, ears deaf that he cannot hear you. He said, But your sins have separated you from God. Iniquity, righteousness, Proverbs 14:34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That's the reason why Satan is very interested in bringing people to sin. The word sin, S-I-N, we were told those days, it means Satan's inner nature. Once Satan can snare people in sin, it isolates them from the life of God and it gives the license for death to come in. You know what we read in Luke chapter 10? He said, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Serpents there is symbolic of Satan and demons. Scorpions is symbolic of death. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, he said that the stink of death. And what is the power of a scorpion? Stink. So all Satan needs to do is multiply iniquity in a place. Make them get used to sin. Make them get used to immorality. Dog eat dog. Man eat man. Wickedness of all kinds. 
that's the reason why our gospel seems not to be progressive because we are dealing with forces here number three we are coming against idolatry and the power of ancestry i wish i had time to talk about this idolatry you go to certain villages and they worship serpents huh? there's a place in gombe like that yes or yes eh you don't want to talk is it your place <laughs> yes or yes uh -uh. i've done my research very well though. and in your prayer for if you are praying for me pray that god will open doors of ministry to those places so that we can go and root down the powers of darkness they worship snake they worship all kinds of things my great grandfather was was given to idol worship in fact he was so strong a witch in his clan that if witches are disturbing you come to him he knows how to arrest them in the night my great grandfather well i know that was the anointing but perverted isn't it idolatry witchcraft ancestry the power of ancestry what is the power of ancestry very simple the power of ancestry is Satan's ability to use the limitations of the ancestors as a snare for successive generation. Many of us may not believe it, but I tell you it's true. I know that you are a new creature. I know that you have given your life to Christ. I know that you are born again, but brother and sisters, there are powers powers of ancestry jesus told the disciples he said i have called you to reap where you did not sow others have labored and you have entered into their labor that speaks of inheritance that means that it is possible for you to experience the dividend of something that somebody has done while there is a positive inheritance there is a negative inheritance some of us come from backgrounds where idolatry prevailed some of us come from background or all kinds of witchcraft prevailed some of us come from backgrounds where there is polygamy and so the spirit of polygamy keeps fighting marriages all through and it is difficult for a husband and a wife in that family to stay together I'm telling you what we are coming against. The Bible told us in the book of Genesis chapter 9 that Noah had three sons. And one of them was called Ham, the second born. And Noah was drunk one time and he lay naked. And Ham came and saw his father's nakedness and went and told his brothers. And when Noah got up and heard about it, Noah said, Cursed be Canaan. Why didn't he say, Cursed be Ham? Why did he say, Cursed be Canaan? Canaan was one of the sons of Ham. But the curse came on his son, not him. Why? Because he said in Exodus chapter 33, he said, visiting the iniquities of the father to the children, even to the third and the fourth generation, the powers of ancestry. Brothers and sisters, please believe it. And it, it will interest you to know that one of the sons of Ham, who was already cursed, was Cush. And Cush is the ancestor of Africa. What was the cause? He said, a servant of servants. Do you realize why Africa is the most blessed continent in terms of mineral resources? But look at our economy. The gospel is not just about getting people saved though. The gospel is about introducing the life of God that can bring healing and restoration to the earth again. I heard the statistics this afternoon. That there is a state called Kogi State that is so blessed with about 35 mineral resources. But if you get to Kogi State, it's one of the most or the least developed. In fact, there is a local government in Kogi State. It's called Dekina Local Government. It's the largest local government in West Africa. But there's no good road there. Recently, statistics have shown that Nigeria has enough natural gas that can sustain the entire continent of Europe. Those of you that follow news, you, you notice that there is EU and AU summit recently, isn't it? Nigeria has enough natural gas to sustain the entire continent of Europe for many years. But gas is one of the most expensive things. We have crude oil, but we are still importing fuel. 
He said, a servant of servants. This night we are going to pray. I feel like I can stop here so that we can pray. Because if we don't deal with these forces, we will not make progress. So we will still walk around this campus and still find people unsaved. You will walk around your classrooms and it will look like Christians are not there. When there is a social event, you will see many more people gathered there. When there is church program, you see few people. Walk on the streets of this campus. What you see tells you the spiritual state of the campus. It tells you the amount and the degree of light of believers in this place. And if it's not sufficient, then we need to arise. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain. To break every chain. To break every chain. One more time. To break every chain. To break every Very quickly, sit down. Let me finish this and we'll pray. I'll skip one point and then we'll just pray. How do we overcome these forces? And see that the gospel is preached and nations are discipled and brought to the Lordship of Christ. Very quickly and we'll pray. Number one, we must know and understand who we are. We must know and understand who we are. You must have an understanding and a revelation of your identity in Christ. Satan's greatest weapon is deception and fear. Satan will make you think you are who you are not. So anytime Satan tells you you are something, always know that you are not that thing. And anytime Satan tells you you are something, always know you are not that thing. Do we understand that? Identity. Very important. He say, I have said, ye are gods and children of the Most High. As many as received him to them, he gave power. Listen to me. You cannot witness for Jesus. You cannot be a disciple for Jesus. You cannot disciple the nations for God if you don't know who you are. Because it is a revelation of who you are that you will give to the people. Moses asked God, he said, if I go to them, who will I tell them sent me? That question was a question of identity. He said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? Ask your neighbor, who are you? I hope he gives you answers. <laughs> there are a lot of people in church who don't know who they are. Oh. They don't know who they are. And that's the reason why every time you come, listen, every time you come under a spiritual attack or a battle, the reality of your spirituality is revealed. What you do in the face of crisis is who you are. It doesn't matter how many scriptures you know. The day that Satan means business with you, your response will show me who you are. I remember one time we were praying here on campus one night. We used to meet and pray 12 to 2 every night, 12 to 2. And then one of those nights we were praying and we held hands 2-2 two, two, and we were praying. Unknown to us, we were in the tent. Outside the tent, there was a deliverance session going on. And I don't know what kind of deliverance that was. The brothers were doing their best. It was a sister who was possessed. And there were about four to five brothers there. They did their best, but it seems that the demon was so strong. And the demon overpowered of all of them and threw all of them away. I'm telling you that it came to a point where they had to remove their belts. I don't know what that one was doing in deliverance. Because when I went out, I saw them with belts. Yet the demon threw all of them away and ran into our tent. And we were praying in tongues, hot tongues, for two hours. Everybody was vibrating. The moment that demonized sister entered, everybody displaced. I looked and saw myself alone in the tent. The reason why a lot of people are afraid of the devil is because they don't have a revelation of who you are. But let me tell you who you are. You are a child of God. 
You are a son and a daughter of the kingdom. All authority, he said, has been given to him. And when he told us go, he gave us the same authority. The Bible says the heavens of heaven belong to God, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. As far as this realm is concerned, spirits don't have control over this realm. It is we that have control. The next time you go to your family and you see a demon harassing the family, tell the demon that this place is for men and not for spirits. Get lost. You must know who you are. Number two, we must choose not to bow to this world and its evil. We already know that the world is filled with wickedness. We must stay immune from the wickedness thereof. We must rebel against the evil that is in this world. We must choose not to bow to, the, to Baal. Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and, and, and Abednego told Nebuchadnezzar, they say, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. The God we serve will deliver us. But if he doesn't deliver us, we will not bow. We must choose to rebel. Enough of bowing to the pressure. Many people have compromised their faith and sold out to the system of this world. But you can stand up and rebel against it. You can rebel against the altars of darkness in your family. You can rebel against the wickedness and immorality around your neighborhood on campus. I remember those days when I was in 100 level. I have very wonderful roommates. They were so wonderful that anytime you come to the room, the room is always locked from inside. Every one of them had girlfriends. And no day will pass that one of them will not bring their girlfriend. Every time you come back, the room is locked. Whether in the morning, you know, in the afternoon, you know, or at midnight. So those days when, I, when we go to pray in the night, when I come back, I have to start praying in tongues as I'm coming. That the angel of God should go and stare the heart of somebody to have mercy and open the door so that I don't stand outside. I never spoke to them. But guess what? One of those nights when I was coming back, all of a sudden, the door opened. One of them opened the door. I came in and I slept off. And during the day when every other person had gone to class, this one was remaining. And as soon as I woke up and I sat down, finished reading my Bible, he took his chair. He came and sat in front of me and started confessing his sins. No preaching. No Jesus love you. And by the end of that semester, all of them repented, gave their life to Christ and went back to church. All. No preaching. But you must rebel against the system. You must say no. Jesus, three times in the temptation, it is written. It is written. What gives you power over temptation, number one, is your knowledge of the word of God. And number two, that the word of God remains consistently on your lips. You must rebel. Tell your neighbor you must rebel. Number three, Finally, we must constantly be on the offensive. We must constantly be on the offensive. You set programs and you wonder why people don't come for programs. Even when you are sharing rice, they will still not come. We must be on the offensive. We know that there are forces that must be brought down for us to be able to make the harvest of our people, of cities around us, of our campuses. We must be on the offensive. There are a lot of Christians who only wait till they are in a crisis before they pray. But Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. It's time for us to step out from the defensive side of Christianity to the offensive side. You must be the one attacking. No waiting for the devil to attack you. The Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 7, Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil and he will flee. When was the last time you resisted? When was the last time you stood in a place of prayer and attacked the powers of darkness? We only wait for problems to come. We must be on the offensive. Can I share this with you and we'll pray? A few years ago, before we started our ministry here in this town, I was praying. And I tell you the truth, man, if God calls you to do anything in the not, in not, in northern Nigeria, especially the northeast, brother and sister, you have powers to contend with. The forces in the north are strong. How do I know? Poverty. 
I'm telling you, the forces in you think there's witchcraft in the south. This not. <laughs> and one of those nights or one of those weeks, I was praying, and God told me to take a prayer walk around the city. Now we are used to it. Those days when we were on campus, we used to go around in the night and pray. Go around, speak over hostels and pray. And we say we take this hostel for Jesus. We take this place for Jesus. Speak over girls' hostel. Speak over this place, that place. So it was not new to me. That was how we saw souls saved, though. That was the reason why during our time we were. See, I told you that this fellowship used to have overflow. It was not ordinary. It's not because of posters. We had won the battle spiritually. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And that's why he had dominion. And so I took that prayer walk, fasting for seven days. And every of those days in the evening, before I break the fast, I would trek around a part of Meduguri. It was not easy. I tell you, on the sixth night, or oh sorry, on the fifth night, I came back that Friday night. And at midnight, I was praying. And I had a vision. And in the vision, I was taken in the spirit realm. That welcome to Meduguri you find around Borno Express, near EFCC office, that place where there is a bridge. As at that time, there was no bridge. But I was taken in the spirit, and at the place I was standing was equivalent to where the bridge was, as though I knew that a year or two years later, there would be a bridge there. And in that place, the Lord opened my eyes, and I saw two dragons wrapped around that place. The eye of one of those dragons is as big as a human head. Their eyes were red, and they were just looking in front of the city. So God told me in that vision that anybody that entered this city, those were the spirits that took record of them, took record of what they came to do, and devised strategies and means to frustrate the purpose of God over them. You just think it's a normal city. Welcome to Medjugorje. And don't, <laughs> the Bible says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted, ye everlasting doors. And when I came out from that vision, I was praying, my eyes opened again, and I saw somebody wearing dark completely, and he was standing in front of me. He was not talking with his mouth, but I could hear him speak from his thoughts, and he was asking me, who are you to come and challenge us? We have not started ministry, I was just praying. I'm telling you, there are gates, there are forces, there are powers. You think that that lady likes fornication. No, there is a force that has enslaved her. There are people held under the shackles of addiction. Even in church, there are people held under all kinds of bondage. If we must disciple them for the kingdom, we must learn and understand warfare. We must be on the offensive. That's the reason why it is good to raise an altar of prayer. Because when you raise an altar, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. It is through prayer that you can exercise your God-ordained dominion. The power of the church is commensurate to the prayer volume of that church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But if the gates of hell are prevailing, it's because we don't have a praying church. It's because we don't have believers who, are, who have decided to be on the offensive. We must stand and say enough is enough to witchcraft. Enough is enough to the powers of darkness. Enough is enough to addiction. We have a lot of young people on this campus addicted with drugs, addicted with all kinds of things. And we pass them every day and we do nothing about it. We must take those souls for Jesus. We must bring them to the Lordship of Christ. Are we ready to pray? Meanwhile, there are some of us here that before you can even do anything for God, you yourself need to be delivered. There are shackles that must be broken. Maybe as a result of territory where we come from. Some of you come from territories where anybody that tries to rise as a man of God, those powers will fight. Some of you come from territories or families where nobody rises and stays successful. Your uncle is the only success story in your family. And everybody is wearing him out to an extent that he had money, but his money is not so much. Some of you are looking at me with strange anointings on your life you don't know. 
But every time you want to pray, it seems as if there is a resistance around you. That man that Jesus casted out demons, legions from, the Bible says that man went around the entire city, the entire region of Decapolis. Decapolis means a, city, a place of ten cities. One man witnessed to ten cities. The next time Jesus crossed over to that place, the Bible says as soon as they recognized him, they all brought their sick to him to touch him. It means that that man carried an apostolic and evangelistic anointing for, for ten cities, but he was held bound. After the angel appeared to Gideon, the first thing God told Gideon is, see, destroy the altars first in your father's house. There are altars that will not allow you to fulfill your purpose, that will not allow us to fulfill this task, this mandate. There are principalities over Unimate. That's the reason why you find the, the way things are going. You find the way things are going the way they are going. Some of you belong to faculties. Where powers have decided that no first class graduate will be a Christian. I hope you know that is a way of discipling the nations. If, a first class, if, if we have first class graduates as Christians consistently in the department, they will hear your Jesus. They will subscribe to your terms. But we must bring these powers under subjection. And the Bible says God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name. That at the name Jesus, every knee shall bow. And at that name, this night and tomorrow afternoon, everything that stands as a limitation against your life, your family, against the church, against the body of Christ, they are getting ready to go down and submit to the name of Jesus. I said they are getting ready to go down and submit to the name of Jesus. Stand on your feet. We are going to pray. Are we ready to pray? My time is up. We are going to pray and then that will be all for tonight. Two prayer points. Number one, you are going to challenge every power and every altar that has withstood the purpose of God in your life, in your family, and in your community where you come from. Every force from the kingdom of darkness that is seen to it that nobody rises from where you come from. And becomes a tool in the hands of God for the purpose of evangelism, evangelism, for the purpose of seeing that souls are saved, for the purpose of establishing the kingdom of God. I want you to raise your voice in the name of Jesus and come against those powers, come against those altars, come against them now. At the name Jesus, at the name Jesus, challenge them. Powers of witchcraft, powers of ancestry, territorial powers, aggressive forces of darkness. Withstanding the purpose of the kingdom in your lineage, in your family. In your life, lift your voice and come against them. Come against them. The Bible says, Whosoever that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. Let those powers be broken. Let those altars be destroyed. We come against them. We come against them. We come against them. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Your reign of terror is over. Your reign of tyranny has come to an end. 
You are standing on behalf of your family. You are standing on behalf of your community. The light of the gospel must break forth. A new era, a new order must arise. Kapalosia kabana habri. Maparas kobalambres keparia kata. Jabra taskova lakaria. Meparos kabarus kavahe. E parasko se poronde kapa. He said, Ye are my battle axe and my weapon of war. And with you I will smite in pieces the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Last prayer, I want you to hold hands, two, two again. We are going to pray and agree. Listen to me. I want you to pray with your partner aggressively. We are going to pray against the forces of darkness that withstands evangelism, that withstands the salvation of souls on our campus. We are going to come against the veil of darkness that has opposed the salvation of the souls of men in our hostels, in our classes, in our departments. Every power from the kingdom of darkness that withstands the salvation of souls will come against you. The power of immorality, the power of addiction, the power of witchcraft, the power of death will come against you. We come against you. We come against you. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, lose your hold. Lose your hold. Lose your hold. Lose your captives. Lose your captives. We release destinies. We release souls. Kato baria kamba sabra doria, membre ke sabambro zoto bahan. Let the power of sin be broken. Let the power of death be broken. Let the power of the grave be shot. We take this campus for Jesus. We insist that the kingdom of God will come on our campus. Come and pray. Come and pray. Come and pray. He said, Ye are my battle axe and my weapons of war. We compel submission. We compel submission. Let the powers of hell submit to the Lordship of Christ. Let the power of cultism be broken. Let the power of cultism be broken. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Now please listen. Please forgive me, sir. I know our time has gone. Tomorrow, I trust God will close on time. Tomorrow, I will not preach much. We are going to pray. Power will fall in this place. 
But I want you to lift your hands. I want to just pray for some people here. There are seven people here that I see a mighty evangelistic anointing coming on. Now, I'm going to count to seven and the power of God will cut across this place. That fire for evangelism, that fire to see souls saved, that fire to work miracles, signs and wonders is coming on you. You have been made a vessel in the hands of God. Holy Ghost, place your hand on those seven people. Man or woman, boy or girl, at the count of seven, anoint them now. Anoint them now. Anoint them now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Does it, does it, does it, does it, does it. Take that fire now. Seven. Take that fire. From the left to the right. Take that fire. Take that grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Just the strings. God is walking here. I don't have time to pray. Tomorrow when I come, we'll do real deliverance prayer. But lift your voice. Anyone here whose life or family is held by the power of witchcraft, I stand by the apostolic anointing. Matoska parata katoya. Shaparata skotaba. I challenge the powers of witchcraft. And in the name of Jesus, let the altars of witchcraft catch fire now. Catch fire now. Catch fire now. Catch fire now. The Holy Ghost is walking. There are people he's setting free now. Now. Now, 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 every spirit that is not of God, that is in this place, spirit of ancestry, spirit of affliction, spirit of sorcery, spirit of death, I arrest you now, 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 go, 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 go. Now just be still. Just close your eyes everywhere. Be still. In 60 seconds, I see the I, I see I see the power of God like fire moving all across this place. Just be still and your eyes closed. Allow the ushers to do their work. Deliverances will happen now. Now, eyes closed everywhere. Just the ushers do their work. Deliverances will happen. Let the powers of witchcraft be crippled. Altars that have been speaking evil against destinies. I silence those altars now. Just be still. No talking. Just be still. Allow God to do what he's doing. Let the yoke be broken. 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 This place, all of you here, just lift your hands, all of you here. Just here, just here. Lift your hands. There are destinies that must be released. Father, anyone in this place, whose destiny is under lock and key, whose destiny has been held by powers of darkness, I stretch my right hand, and in the name of Jesus, by your mighty power, let there be deliverance now. 
Just be still. Only these people here. Let there be deliverance. Let there be deliverance. I rebuke the spirit of death. I rebuke the spirit of death. Anabrahaskovala de Subrediga Hazanubra. Maranda Skapranda Bruski Vala Haski Vaila. Lesivia. This lady wearing red. Here, yeah, yes. Just come. Come. Let me pray for you. Tomorrow we'll do all the prayer. We're already out of time. Come, my dear. Just lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, I stretch my hands towards her. Let every evil voice that has been speaking in this family be silenced now. I break the yoke by the anointing now. I break the yoke by the anointing. Let them go now. Just, just stay by her. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that from today, everything that has stand or that has been standing as a resistance to the gospel in this campus, we bring them under subjection. We bring them to the Lordship of Jesus. We declare massive salvation over this campus. We pray in the name of Jesus that the Spirit of God will begin to do a new work around and across this campus. Let men be brought to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, for everyone here present that by the cause of these three days, Lord, let there be an anointing that will break out from heaven that will sit on everybody here present Amen. in Jesus name Amen. now because of time tomorrow I want to urge you invite as many as you can tomorrow morning or afternoon I believe sir 1130 tomorrow I'm not going to preach for long I'm just going to preach for 15 minutes and then we are going to pray tomorrow is going to be a power service some of you, the grace of God that is inside of you that you don't know will come out tomorrow. Some of you, your destinies will be revealed. This lady, this fair lady with blue gown, yes. Can you stretch your hands towards me? Do you believe in the anointing? I see a strong prophetic anointing on you. And God will begin to speak to you and communicate to you in dreams and in visions. And in the name of Jesus, I release that fire over you now. I release that fire. Take it now. In the name of Jesus. Your life will never remain the same. Your life will never remain the same. Help her. Help her. Tomorrow will be an impartation meeting. And deliverance. There are many things I just saw today that I cannot do. Tomorrow we will do it. And God will be glorified. There is a young man that God spoke to me about before this meeting began. I'm going to look for him tomorrow as an anointing that he will carry. Thank you very much once again, sir. God bless you. Please wave your hands and give God praise for today.